Good afternoon again, officially. It was brought to my attention by someone in the auditorium that they had noticed over the last 25 years and some odd months that being in the ministry, I've never drank any water when I was preaching, but today I'm quite thirsty. Would you give me a glass of water? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> The Hebrew word that was translated into Greek, then into English, for atonement is number 3722 in the Strong's Concordance. It means to cover, also to cancel. It means to cleanse. It means to forgive. It also means to be merciful, to pardon, to purge away, to make reconciliation. Then you have Webster's Unabridged Dictionary that says the act of bringing into concord, which is a state of agreement, harmony, or covenant, restoration of relations, reconciliation, propitiation. Now the word restoration, when you look it up in the Unabridged Dictionary, it says bringing back or putting together into a former condition. It means reinstatement, the ultimate bringing of the whole universe, including all men, into harmony with the will of God. That's right in Webster's Dictionary. And then it concludes with the word restitution. This is biblical. Because the Bible tells us very clearly in Acts chapter 3, verse 18 to 21, the following. Acts 3, verse 18 to 21. <clears throat> but those things which God before had shown to the mouth of all of his prophets, that Jesus should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets. So there is coming a restitution but a restitution from what and why? Now, the word reconciliation, according to Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, meant to restore to friendship. It means to bring back into harmony. It means to bring to quiet submission, to restore to favor. It means to reunite, to harmonize. Then the word propitiation, according to the Webster's unabridged dictionary that has every single definition of the word, it means to atone, render favorable. It means appeasing divine justice and effecting reconciliation between God and man. Now, with all of these definitions in mind, and I have the advantage, I've got them written before me. But keep them in mind. Let's go to a very important section of scriptures now that begins to unfold this thing called atonement. Because after all, right now we are observing the day of atonement. In Leviticus chapter 16, Leviticus 16, something very unusual was told by God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, before he came into human form, to Moses and to Aaron. Something they were to do that was very important for us to understand what atonement is all about. In verse 5 it says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering. Notice both of these goats were to be a sin offering. And one ram for a burnt offering. Now the reason for the ram was because 
Aaron needed his own sins atoned for. So God allowed him to make an atonement for himself and his whole house by offering a bullock. Verse 7, he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now notice, I want to give a little summary of what I've talked about so far. There's two kids of goats. They're young, about a year old. Even the priest, or today, let's bring it down to our time, the minister who is a human being must make atonement for himself. And then those within the family who have been baptized and have received the Holy Spirit and the children who are under their authority and in submission must have atonement made for them. All baptized members today are to be atoned for their sins. They're to be covered. They're to be canceled. They're to be purged out of our life. We're, we will be shown forgiveness of those sins. God will show mercy to us. He will pardon those sins. He will make reconciliation. He will bring us back into a state of harmony, into a covenant relationship with himself. He will restore that relation that was once given to the human race in the Garden of Eden. And so with all this in mind, now let's continue. Verse 8, Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for a scapegoat. Now this is very interesting because there was no difference in these two goats whatsoever. No difference. He even had to, what we would call today, maybe draw cards, high card is the one, or roll the dice, the high numbers on the dice. And so one of these goats was selected for the Lord, the other for a scapegoat. Now, what about the scapegoat? It means that it would escape something. We'll get to that in a moment. Then verse 9, And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. So one goat now was to be a sin offering. We know that all offerings were killed. Their blood was offered upon the altar. Just like we see in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the heavenlies. And how the shed blood of Jesus Christ is placed on the altar before the Lord to make an atonement to forgive our sins. Every time we go to him and ask forgiveness for one of our sins, something we've done, something that we have neglected to do that becomes a sin because to him that knows to do good and does it not, it's sin. So there are many ways to sin. And when we miss the mark, that old archer's term called sin, missing the bullseye of perfection, then we have to be atoned for. And so one of these goats was offered as a sin offering. Then verse 10, But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now notice what this does say. The other goat that was not to be the sin offering was presented alive before the Lord. And what was the purpose of that goat being presented alive? It was to make an atonement. It was to cancel sins. It was to cover sins. It was to cleanse us of sins. It was to forgive, to be merciful to us. It was to purge away all of our guilt. It was to bring us back into harmony with God, into that perfect covenant relationship. It was to restore us to divine favor. Now this is very important for us to understand because Jesus was the sin offering. He died for the sins of the whole world. Then he was resurrected three days and three nights later, and that was the only sign that he gave 
I'll not turn there, but Matthew 12, 38 to 40, the only sign he gave to the unbelieving Jews without the Holy Spirit of that day was that he would die for the sins of the world. And three days and three nights later, he would come out of that grave alive. Now, God was not going to resurrect a goat from the dead. So he had them bring two identical goats. One of them was to die as a sin offering. The other was to be presented alive, representing the resurrected Jesus Christ who would atone for our sins. Now think about it a minute, because I remember a teaching that once existed that the one goat was a sin offering. The other goat of departure, or this scapegoat, was Satan. This was a misunderstanding. If you want to get technical according to biblical terms, it was a heresy. Because Christ died for our sins and Christ alone can atone for our sins. Satan cannot atone for any sin. He's the instigator. He's the cause of sin. And so Jesus, being represented by two goats, one died for the sins of the people the other was presented alive before God the Father in the heavens, as it were. Only it was before the door of the tabernacle at that time. To be accepted and to make atonement for Israel. Notice Leviticus 16, verse 14 to 16. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Now this was, he was covering up his own sins with the blood. Then shall the, he kill the goat of the sin offering. That is for the people. And bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. And sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. And before the mercy seat... And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Everyone, not one person excluded, was required to have his or her sins covered, canceled, cleansed, forgiven, mercy shown toward them. They were to be pardoned and purged away from that individual, every person in Israel. The people were to be brought into a harmonious relationship with God by this cancellation of sin. They were to be brought into agreement with a great God by the cancellation of their sins. After all, the Bible does say, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And the reason the human race has fallen into sin is because they do not agree with God. They won't live by his everlasting covenant for which Jesus came to shed his blood, according to Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21. And so because the human race will not obey it, they don't walk with God. And how can the human race walk with God unless they are brought back into a favorable condition with him? Brought into some type of quiet submission to the great God of the universe. Let's notice now in the newer writings in Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, and I'll just zero in in this particular case on one verse. Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was without sin. He was represented in olden times in Leviticus 16 by the goat. 
that was to become a sin offering, and yet that goat had never had a blemish. Goats can't sin. They live by instinct. And so it died. And it was killed as a sin offering, and it represented Jesus, the Christ of Almighty God. Notice now in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. I'll start down around verse 27 to 31. Matthew 27, 27 to 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited his a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified. So Jesus was now being prepared. It was like the goat that was brought to the door of the tabernacle. It hadn't been killed yet when it got there, but it was to be presented before the Lord. And here was Jesus in trial, and he was convicted. Oh, he had people there defending him, and they voted in the Sanhedrin to release him, and that's why they call for treason, said he was a king. And so they killed him because of treason. And so Jesus was led away to be killed for your sins, for my sins. Notice in Matthew 27, verse 35 to 37. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. They are the ones that accused him. He was presented before the Father. He was guiltless. He was sinless. He was led away and he died. He shed the blood of the everlasting covenant so that we could be forgiven, be atoned for. Notice the same chapter, Matthew 27, verse 45 to 53. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lamai sabachthani. That is to say, because that was written in Aramaic, that phrase, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calls for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran, took a sponge, must not have been the Day of Atonement, and filled it with vinegar and put it on the reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, let's just let him be. Let him alone. Let it see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost or spirit in the actual Greek language. His breath left his body. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. It was torn in half from top to bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent or tore. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Now, that didn't happen right on the spot, but notice when it did happen. And came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So the second goat that was offered was to be presented alive before the Lord. It was a sinless, a blemish-free goat, 
representing the life of Jesus Christ, one without sin. Chapter 28 of Matthew, verse 1 to 6. In the end of the Sabbath, that means right at twilight, as you begin to see the first three or four stars in the sky, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other mother to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now can you imagine coming upon such a scene as this? You're going to see the very area where the Savior lay, his dead body. And you get there and the stone is rolled back. You have free access to go into the tomb to inspect it. And sitting there are two angels. If an angel were to appear to us in their glory, we'd probably have to go get a new fitting for teeth. They would drop. Verse 3, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake. And became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not. Look, don't you be afraid of my sight? For I know whom you seek, which was crucified. They knew they were seeking Jesus. They were sent there so that they could meet with them when they came looking for him. He's not here. He is risen as he said. So here is Jesus now, risen from the dead. Those two goats back there, perfect without blemish. One goat was killed. Its blood put on the mercy seat for the sins of Israel. The other goat was presented alive before the tabernacle, before the door of it, where Jesus in his old state before he came into human form and died for the sins of the world, that's where he dwelt. And so in John chapter 20, starting verse 11 down through verse 20, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And what did she see? Or well, two angels in white, sitting, one of them at the head, one at the foot, where Jesus' body had lain, past tense. It wasn't there anymore. And they said unto her, Woman, look, let's put it in modern English. Why are you crying? Why are you weeping? And she said unto them, Because they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. They thought that they were trying to prevent the disciples from knowing whether there was a resurrection, which he claimed. So they thought they had just stolen his body and was going to bring it out for public display at a later time. So she was in tears, weeping. Verse 14, when she had thus said, she turned herself around or back and saw Jesus standing. But the key is, she didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? Look, who are you looking for? Who do you seek? And she, supposing that he was a gardener, said unto him, Sir, if you've borne or carried him from here, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Look, if you've removed the body, I'll take it off your hands. Jesus said unto her, Mary, probably in that very familiar tone that he had used thousands of times. And she instantly knew who it was. To be exact, if I remember the documents, said that she was checked into the hospital with whiplash that day. Just kidding. But she turned around so quickly, it said, she turned herself and said, Rabboni, which is to say, Master he was her master. He was her teacher. And he said, I will not stay in the grave. 
So Jesus continued a conversation because she was so thrilled that he was alive and not dead. I'm sure she wanted to just throw her arms around his neck and give him a big squeeze and a hug. He backed up. He said, touch me not, verse 17, for I'm not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, to my God and your God. So now he had told her what his goal was. I died as that goat, as a sin offering. Now I'm going to become the other goat and presented alive. Before God the Father, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, late afternoon, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, what happened? Jesus came right into the room and materialized right in front of them. And he said, peace be unto you. And when he said that, he began to show the nail prints in his hands, his feet, and his side. And they were very thrilled that the living Savior that they thought was dead had, been, had his body taken from them. That he was there alive in his new glorified state. He didn't remain dead. He came out of the grave and he presented himself alive before God the Father in the throne room in the heavens. That tells us there is very considerably fast speed by which the God family can transport themselves in some manner. To God's throne and back. In less than a day, in the morning he was talking already. And by late afternoon he was already back, having presented himself before the Lord, our God. But what does this mean to you? What does it mean to me? Because after all, you and I have been called, we've been chosen. We're to remain faithful we have had, as it were, our slate of sins cleansed. We've had them eliminated. We can go to bed at night and not even consider one thing that we had done during the day if we have asked forgiveness and meant it with our heart. God knows. He tries the reins of the heart. He knows what we're thinking. I'll not turn there, but Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit that he has given to us sends messages to the Father and groans and utterances our feelings, our emotions, our thoughts, our desires. As it were, he reads our mind to know whether we are being loyal to him, faithful to him, whether we have taken the sacrifice of Jesus personally whether it has meaning to us or whether we just nominally with our mind accept it, but we won't live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He knows. That's why judgment is upon the house of God today. Not one of us will go into the kingdom of God unless we have been judged and pronounced guiltless. Not that we don't make our share of mistakes. We do. We make our share of sins, but when we go in heart-rendering repentance, God forgives because he sprinkles the blood of Jesus Christ on the mercy seat before the throne of God in the heavens. Notice Romans 5, verse 1 to 11. Therefore, being justified by faith, Justified means to be made right in the sight of God by faith. And many people don't even understand what by faith means. It's by faith in the shed blood of Jesus that a God stepped down out of the heavens and died to forgive our sins. The life of a God was paid 
And the father was there to resurrect him from the dead because he did not deserve to die. He had committed no sin. He took all of our sins upon himself. That's why we cannot think that we are doing anything of our own. We are not righteous. It is Christ's righteousness in us. If Christ had not given us the Holy Spirit, if He had not been resurrected from the dead, we would still be living in our sins. We would never have received the Holy Spirit that allows us to develop the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, meekness, faith self-control or temperance, we wouldn't be able to develop these fruit of the Spirit unless we were justified, made right with God. And the minute we rose up out of that watery grave of baptism when we said, we're leaving all of our sins behind, we're coming into a covenant relationship with our God, He is going to forgive my sins and I will obey Him and His book from the rest of my life. And we're made justified by the shed blood of Jesus. And that is that we have faith in that death and the blood that it was good enough to forgive all of our sins. As a direct result, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith. That once again is faith in that shed blood that he died so that we wouldn't have to remain dead. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, the hope of the resurrection from the dead, the hope of a new body where we'll be perfected and never sin again. It'll be a permanent relationship, a permanent covenant with God, and we will live it permanently. Because God's, I will use a human term, DNA pattern is in us. He is perfect, therefore we will be perfect once we receive that new body, our hope. Verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Why would we glory in tribulations when people come against us? We know there is a Satan out there. We know there's demons, the fallen angels. We know there's evil spirits. They're unseen to the human eye, but they affect, affect every one of us. They afflict the world. They bring tribulation across our path. And when they bring tribulation across our path, <clears throat> we have to turn to the very one that died to forgive us so that we will not sin in that tribulation. We will be able to withstand Slipping back into a lifestyle of sin, giving in to the pressure that Satan and his demons and evil spirits are putting upon us, and inspiring society and individuals around us to afflict us, to mock us for our belief. He knew that we would have to go through these tribulations, but we don't have to worry about it. We can rejoice in them and through them until they are accomplished and finished. Because we know that if we were to die right now, the next instant we would wake up in the kingdom of God with a new, immortal, glorified, spirit-composed body just like Jesus and just like God the Father. That's why we can glory in tribulation. It doesn't matter what a human being can do to us, Satan, his demons. It doesn't matter. Cut our head off. Cut our tongue out. It doesn't matter the pressure they put upon us as long as we lay our life at the feet of Jesus. Knowing that tribulation works patience. Every time you go through some type of tribulation and you think your whole world is caving in upon you. But you come through it. You live through it. And all of a sudden you've developed just a little more of the fruit of the Spirit. You have patience. Patience. Verse 4, patience works experience. Yes, we've learned through experience how to deal with demons, how to recognize them. And experience hope. Yes, we have hope of the glory that is yet to come for us. 
Jesus already has that glory. He even prayed in John 17, 5 and 6. He said, my work's finished. Give me back the glory that I had with you from the, before the beginning of the world. He knew that he was going to die, and when he died, and this flesh body would be changed, and he would be resurrected. That was his hope, to receive the body that he had before, when he was with the Father. Verse 5, and hope makes not ashamed. Not one person that accepts the name of Jesus Christ and lives by his everlasting covenant and will not shrink backward under persecution and tribulation needs ever to be ashamed. All they can do is take your life. They've taken the lives of nearly, nearly every Christian that's lived of any prominence spoken of in the Bible and history. But they'll be in the resurrection. You will too. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And it's given to us by God the Father and Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, because we were willing to receive the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. And therefore, the Holy Spirit comes inside of our mind. It was given to us as a down payment upon our new glorified body. It was given to us so that we could develop the divine nature of God the Father and Jesus. So that we could be different from the rest of the world. The rest of the world can have their tangles, their wars, their hatred. But Jesus said, how can you love God if you don't love your fellow man that you can see when you've never seen God? Jesus also said, this is how all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. That love is a divine love, not a human love. But it's supernatural. It goes over and beyond and it can only be received by the true Holy Spirit of God. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, it will begin to change our life. And if a change of our life does not occur over a period of time, we'd better be examining ourselves to see whether we're quenching the Spirit or to see whether we never repented to begin with. Verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. I'll be the first one if we have a lineup to confess that I was ungodly. I can remember my sins. I don't want to. They've been covered with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They've been atoned for. But I know that I committed sins and I had to have that sacrifice or I would remain dead forever. What about you? Do you really recognize them? Have you really been willing to change your life and get into harmony with God? Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us. Look what he's done. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't go looking for God. We were living according to our human nature, the downward pull of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We were fulfilling all of these sins in our life to one degree or another. But God the Father sent Jesus down here in spite of us in spite of every human that has ever lived, and said, I want you to die. Live perfect first. I'll resurrect you. Then you will be the head of the church. You will be the administrator of the Holy Spirit. Then we will bring brothers and sisters into the family as kings and priests and judges, preparing their lives for the atoning of the rest of the world. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified or made right with God by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And wrath is permanent death. The wrath of God is in Revelation 16, but that's a temporary thing. The real wrath of God is permanent death. In the lake of fire and we're burned up. 
We're left with ashes and inert gases floating out into the atmosphere. And there is no return from it. So we're going to be saved from that because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies, and we were because every one of us recognized that we had committed violations against God's way of life, if we hadn't recognized it, why would we ever have wanted to be baptized and have those sins forgiven? When we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death, by the death of his son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There is the two goats once again. One goat died. Jesus died. And then the other goat was presented before the Lord alive. And so Jesus ascended into the heavens alive, resurrected from the dead. And we're going to be saved because he came out of that grave. It's nothing that we have done to earn it. After all, didn't Jesus say in John 15, 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. And he sent us to bring forth fruit that will remain until the resurrection. Verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Yes, we have received the cancellation of every sin that we've ever committed. Every thought. Everything that has been evil. We have been cleansed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He is our atonement. We've been forgiven. We've been pardoned of our sins. If we have truly accepted Jesus Christ's death as payment for our own sins. After all, Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. The way we live after receiving forgiveness will determine whether we remain justified, right in God's eyes, forgiven or not. We have been given the opportunity to be in a state of agreement, harmony, or covenant with the great God of the universe that created everything. We have been restored to divine favor with God. Reconciliation has occurred to all of us that have received the Holy Spirit and are now living according to God's true ways of life. Jesus is reconciling all peoples, not just us. It's like God is calling us ahead of time. He's calling a governmental unit that will be in agreement because it says in Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together except they be agreed? So God has brought us into agreement with him and his way of life by forgiving our sins so that we can be preparing now for that rulership position in the kingdom of God. But just like I mentioned a scripture, Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Jesus hand-selected you to prepare for his kingdom to be a living, immortal son of God or daughter of God in the family of God. He has hand-selected you above all people on earth for some reason. And you and I had nothing to do with the matter. That's why no one can glory. We were going our way. We were still killing Jesus daily by our lives. But he dipped down out of all the masses of humanity, the six billion people that are on earth plus today. And he said, I'll take all the mics in that church down in Waxahachie. I'll take anyone else. Yep, I'll take them. I'll draw them by my spirit. I'll put my spirit in them. I'm going to groom them for rulership in the kingdom of God so they'll have perfect character just like I do. We have to have rulers. We have to have our government in place. 
when God sets about to atone for the world. After all, think about this. You have Passover. Jesus died for the sins of the world. That was the very beginning of the salvation process, not the end of it, the way churches teach. It was the beginning. Everybody had been deceived. They were lying in sin. They would not have been salvation for anyone. But Jesus died and started the salvation process. And then the days of unleavened bread, putting sin out of our lives, he called people in advance of the rest of the world to begin to unleaven themselves, to begin to develop the divine nature of God the Father and Jesus Christ, to fit themselves into a harmonious relationship, to be rulers. And then the day of Pentecost, he gave his spirit so that you and I could have the power to overcome Satan and his demons. The power to overcome our human nature, our flesh. And it is not our power. Human effort will never get you into the kingdom of God. It is either Jesus or nothing. You and I can live and think we're doing things righteously, but it is Jesus if, our, if we have died to our old way of life. It is His power, the Holy Spirit, that gets, strengthens us. And gives us the capability to overcome and say no to a sin that lust is just reeking out of us. And we say, no, I will not fulfill that lust. Jesus bought me. I will not surrender. Jesus then, after he fulfills his rulership team... He calls enough people throughout the ages from righteous Abel right on down to the last person that will ever receive God's Spirit before the seventh trump. He is fitting them into governmental positions because when the atonement for the world begins. And notice after Pentecost comes trumpets. The seventh trump when Christ returns. When all of a sudden the wrath of God, the seven last plagues will be poured out. And then you'll not only have the seven last plagues will be poured out, but you'll have a time when we are given our reward, our new bodies, the seventh trump. The righteous dead will be resurrected. We will meet at the sea of glass, Revelation 15. We will receive at the marriage supper of the Lamb our crowns, our rulership position. Everything will be set in place after the Feast of Trumpets. The next event is the Day of Atonement. While we're being atoned for in advance, He's preparing the first fruits to become kings and priests and sit on thrones to judge the nations. There has to be population if we're going to have rulers. Who are we going to rule over? The Day of Atonement comes after trumpets, after you and I are already glorified. But you see, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, it also says very clearly that it will be the time of the dead that they should be judged, not the saints. The saints have already been judged and received their new body. But God is going to reconcile all peoples that will to himself. Notice Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I'll start down in verse 11 through 22. Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles or someone of another nation other than Israel in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now think about what this is saying. He's talking about Israel as if they were saved when they sinned just as badly or worse than the other nations. 
And yet he's talking to a church that is not Israelite and saying you were without hope when you were not a part of Israel. So that means something is going to have to happen if Israel is going to be atoned and the other nations are going to become a part of it and they're going to have hope. Verse 13, And now in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both, that is, the other nations of the world and Israelites that had hope, a covenant relationship with God, one. And hath broken down the middle wall of perdition between us. Now, there was a partition. It was called the court of the Gentiles and the other nationalities could come onto this court but there were signs that said if you go any further and you're not an Israelite you will be killed they didn't enter into the temple it was only the outer court that has been torn down everybody on earth through Jesus Christ can come to God the Father verse 15 having abolished in his flesh the enmity that's the hostility even in the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Yes, that ordinance said you go past this place, the court of the Gentiles, and you'll die. For to make in himself of two one new man. So everybody on the face of the earth now was going to receive an opportunity of salvation because Jesus is making peace between all nationalities. And that he might reconcile both, yes, the other nations and Israelites unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. That's why a true Christian, after they have had the Holy Spirit inside of their mind long enough, there will be no longer prejudice against a person of another race that is called into God's church. There cannot be. Because the Bible says God Almighty through Jesus Christ has torn down the enmity, the hostility. We're to look at each other as a new spirit composed person. Not of another nation outside of Israel. No, we're the church. We're to be born with a new body to be rulers. Verse 17. And Jesus came and preached peace. To you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, yes, both to the nations and to Israel. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And here is the church, every one of us, and others like us, whoever they may be on the face of the earth. I don't know their names. We don't know them. But if God has raised them up and He's selected them and He's put His Holy Spirit inside of their mind, they are a bona fide Christian, follower, disciple of Jesus. They have had their sins forgiven. We just don't know who they are. But they... And we and every other person on the face of the earth are now the holy temple in which the Lord Jesus Christ resides. He's living his life over inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we quench the Spirit, we are quenching the instructions of Jesus. Verse 22, in whom you also are built together for, an habit, for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God's Spirit has called each and every one of us. Now it's up to us to determine in our own life what we're doing with that calling. The atonement will go to the world, but it's going to us first in advance so that we can be prepared to enter into the kingdom of God. But God has called us, especially for a job. But the rest of the world will be atoned for. Notice in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 to 21. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And that's what we're doing. 
We're warning the nation that it is going into national captivity if it does not turn back to the true God of the Bible, not the false gods of the world. So God has given us a ministry of reconciliation, telling people something that God, in verse 19, was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors. I see Ambassador Jim over there. Ambassador Jeff back there. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're representing the kingdom of God on earth. That's why we don't meddle in this world's political affairs. We're waiting for the kingdom of God. If somebody asks me, well, what political party do you belong to? I said, Christ. They say, oh, are you a Republican or Democrat? I said, no, I'm a Christian. I'm waiting for the return of Christ to establish his government. They've never heard such a thing. I don't care if they claim to be Christians. They've got to be a Republican or Democrat. No, Christians are ambassadors for the kingdom of God. They're representing God to this earth. As though God did beseech you by us. Here we are shouting from the rooftop. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Turn while you can. And you can also have an opportunity to be born at the seventh trump with a new body, as a king and a priest, and help rule the world. This is the gospel, the good news of the coming kingdom of God. Verse 21, For he's made in him to be sin for us. Jesus didn't have any sin, but God made him sin because of what we've done, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God is making us righteous. We're not making ourselves righteous. Notice Paul gave a warning in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He's made you right with him. In the body of this flesh, through death, Jesus died to reconcile us, to present you, to present me, to present others like us, wherever they may be found on planet earth, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If, notice that little word, if you continue in the faith, the belief that Jesus' sacrifice will pay your sins. And once you believe that, you will actively obey him and not disobey him. Ground it and settle and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, the hope of the coming kingdom of God, the hope of the death of Jesus Christ and his shed blood cleansing us, the hope that we will receive the new body and become a king and a priest and a judge in the kingdom of God which you've heard and was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Yes, Paul was a minister, but in the end of the age, I'm a minister and I preach it to you. And I'll preach it from the rooftop if, one, if just one person would listen and change their life so that they could also come under the leadership of Jesus Christ. But Christ has already completed his task he died that day. He was resurrected three days and three nights later. Now it's up to you, it's up to me. What we're going to do with the calling that Jesus has given us. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, it says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. He came into human form. He experienced the pull of the flesh. He knew what it was like for that gal to walk down the street in a bikini, or better than that, a thong. And he had to move his eyes in a different direction very quickly. 
He knew what it was like, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. He knew. But he didn't let it overcome him. He overcame it so that you and I could be born into the family of God. So that we could be atoned and the rest of the world could be atoned. Yes, he wanted to be a merciful and faithful high priest and things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So he's reconciling us back by forgiving our sins. And eventually, the whole world, except for the few rebels who will not let God rule over them. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He knows how you feel. He knows when you've lost your job and you're living by a hair away from bankruptcy. He knows. He knows that he was tempted. He overcame it. You stick with Jesus. You have faith that you are under his authority, no matter what the circumstance in your life seems to be. Because you see, it only seems to be that way. Because things come across our path to make sure that we are tried and tested and become true. Because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He's going to know us. Are we worth atoning for? He selected us. He must think so. Therefore, there's not one thing that a person in this auditorium or listening by telephone or computer hookup. Not one thing that God does not know about in your life. And the instant he wants this seeming terrible event to end, he will bring it to a close. I've seen it happen too many times. But are we introspecting our lives to make sure that we are remaining in that atoning sacrifice of Jesus? That's the first thing we ever do. Is we should look. To ourselves to see, am I committed a sin? Has God withdrawn his hand from me? And if we honestly, with all of our heart, after praying and asking God to reveal it, if we have come to the conclusion, I am doing the very best I can with the Spirit of God, with the knowledge I have, then you turn it over to Jesus. You're probably being attacked by the unseen spirit world. Notice Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. And that's what you and I are. The time has not been appointed yet. To where we have that new glorified body. So we're still learning, overcoming, developing our character. Verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. We participated just like the rest of the world because we hadn't been called out of it yet. There were certain times of the year that we just jumped over the moon for. We couldn't wait for it to come around because what am I going to get under that tree? We all did it unless you were born in the church knowing the truth. But when the fullness of the time came was God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. He was subject to death if he violated the law one time. But what was he sent for? To redeem them that were under the law. We were under the penalty of death. There was no hope for us. It was a sure death penalty and that was it. So Jesus came, gave up his spirit composed body and came in a human form. So that he could be tempted just like you and me. That we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, or Daddy, Father. 
This is to be now a personal relationship with our Father. And it was all done because Jesus was willing to die. Jesus is our elder brother. He is the one that made the atonement for our, sacrifice, for our lives. He sacrificed himself. Verse 7. Wherefore, you are no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You cannot be a legal heir unless you are a legal child of the parent offering and handing down his estate. When it says you are an heir of God, that means that you are a child of God. And when you receive that new glorified body, you will be born into the family of God. You will be a child of God, immortal, never to die again. How be it then, verse 8, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Paul went so far as to tell them not to go back into pagan holidays, pagan celebrations. Oh, they had about a third of the year set off on their calendar for games and activities to their gods and goddesses. We've been redeemed, purchased from the death penalty because of the way we lived before. We observe Satan's ways and not God's ways, B.C., before conversion. We're now free from the death penalty because Jesus Christ made it so by his death. And now we're looking forward to eternity with God the Father because Jesus lives. We have been justified, made right in God's eyes, and we will remain justified as long as we are obedient to all of God's ways. Obedience is not a bad word. It's a good word. It gives the indication of the heart. And it shows the path by which we're walking. Notice in Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, I'll start in verse 11 through verse 15. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world because God has revealed himself to us we have to be different than the rest of the world we can't continue with the same associations that are sinners we can't continue to go clubbing where there's drunkenness debauchery looking for the pickup of a man or a woman we can't do those things anymore to commit fornication Break wedlock and adultery, those kind of things. We can't do it. We have to live righteously in this present world. This makes us different. And it will make us look different to the rest of the world when we won't go along with their sinful activities. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope, yes, that new body. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. All. Nothing remains. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Let's pause for a moment. Is every one of us, as we think in our own mind, are we zealous of good works? Do we desire God's ways or are we looking to gratify the flesh that violates God's ways? Only you can answer for yourself and only I can answer for myself. It's either zealous for good works and living righteously 
or we will toy with the world and be like the world. Verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. Brethren, Jesus raised me up as a minister, and I am not ashamed of that. I know what happened. Nobody else on earth needs to know or even believe it. All they have to do is listen to the words. And are they coming straight from the Bible? Are they God's words? Do they tell you to change, to get right with him, to live by every word that comes out of his mouth and will not compromise? Jesus Christ has called every one of us to live righteously. He has called us because he's wanted to forgive you of your sins. He's wanted to redeem you, to purchase you back from sure death so that you can live forever. Notice Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse is the death penalty for violation of the law. And Jesus was made a curse for us. He died on that cross so that we wouldn't have to die and remain dead forever. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Jesus died. You're living. Jesus forgave your sins. You received his Holy Spirit. Jesus appeared before the Father to atone for your sins and my sins. We have an opportunity to live forever, to be born into the very family of God, but it's all because of the atoning process of Jesus Christ. Without that atoning process, we're all as good as dead. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 23. Because it is written, Be you holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges, according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now, does that mean tremble? No. It means that Jesus Christ died, a God, whose one life is worth more than all human beings made of flesh and blood that is in rot and decay. His one life is worth more than all of ours. And here we are being judged of God. And he is not a respecter of persons, whether you're a woman or a man, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're middle class, whether you dress well or don't dress well. He's looking at the heart and the mind. And he said that you and I better pass our time here recognizing the sacrifice of Jesus and fear not living by every word of God that would cause the sacrifice of Jesus to be negated in our life and a sure lake of fire to follow. Verse 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like, you know, money, you can't be bribed, can't be bought, from your vain conduct, the worthless conduct that we had, that we received it by the traditions of this world that we lived in, but with the precious blood of Christ, verse 19, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He's the one that died for us. Verse 20, who verily was foreordained. This was all planned out in advance before the foundation of the world. It was already pre-planned because Satan was left here. And he deceived starting with the Garden of Eden. So God knew that he was leaving Satan here. So he preordained a way to reconcile the world back to himself. Us first as first fruits, the first harvest of human beings to a new glorified body. Then later, the rest of the world was to be ordained through salvation. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was, made, but was manifest or made known in these last times for you. Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith 
and your hope might be in God, you can have the same hope of glory that Jesus does. He will always have the preeminence in the family. He will always be under God the Father. It says so back there in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28. He will turn all the salvation process, all that are saved, back to the Father. And he will be second to the Father, and we will be the younger brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. The Spirit's what gave us the power to obey. Unto unfeigned, no pretending love of the brethren. We don't staple on a church face and come with a smile and can't wait till we get home to take it off because we're not converted. No, we come because we love God. We love His people. We can't wait to see them, to shake their hand, to hug their neck, to find out how, how it was with them that week. Yes, you cannot be a pretender and be on God's side. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Notice what he says now. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word born is begotten. It, or it is ganea. It could be begotten. God's spirit comes into our mind today and we're begotten, just like the seed of a male impregnates the egg of a female and it's begotten. It's not born yet. Or it could be translated born if you are already have your new spirit composed body. And you're born into the family. So we are begotten of God. We have God's seed in us. We have his, as it were, DNA pattern that is perfecting us, that is rooting out the evil concepts of the world out of our character. He's preparing us for rulership in his family. We dare not take that lightly. Notice also Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 26. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes every one of us. But notice the next sentence. Being justified freely, that is being made right with God, by his grace, through the redemption, the purchase back so that we will not remain dead that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, that his death, his shed blood, paid the penalty of death for us to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Our past is gone through the forbearance of God. Yes, everything is gone. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. If you and I believe in that sacrifice that he is atoning for the world, then you and I can remain justified. Our sins will never be held against us. The death penalty is gone, forever removed, as long as we remain faithful and repent of our daily sins. Ask God to forgive us of the things that we didn't even know we did wrong that day. It might have been a mistake or a stumbling block to someone. Or self-righteousness. Our sins have been atoned by the shed blood of Jesus we are now back in favor with God in spite of our past. You don't ever have to look back. Don't let Satan and his demons throw into your mind sins of the past if you've really repented. They're gone. They're buried with Jesus in that grave. In your watery grave of baptism. 
Nobody has a right to ever throw one of those sins back into your face. Never. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. For you see your calling, brethren, how the not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. We don't see very many senators. We don't see very many Bilderberg members, Bilderbergers. We don't see very many Illuminati worshipers of Lucifer in high-ranking positions in government and in banking fraternities coming out and repenting, do we? But God has chosen the foolish, and the word things should have been ones of the world to confound the wise. He's called you and me to be their rulers so that their knees will be bent before us. They will learn humility for the first time. They will learn to obey the true God of the universe. And God has chosen the weak ones of the world to confound the ones which are mighty. I don't see anybody on a presidential advisory board in this auditorium. We are considered the weak of the world in the eyes of those mighty men that worship Lucifer, that rule the earth. But God has called you to a special calling beyond what any of them could ever even consider. They've, God has called you to become his very son or daughter with the same bodily makeup composed of spirit because the Bible says God is a spirit. That's what we're going to be. It says so in Romans 3, verse 6. That which is born of the Spirit, or John, I'm sorry, 3, verse 6. That which is born of the Spirit is or becomes Spirit. Verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 1. And base ones of the world. And ones which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and all things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. They're going to feel mighty foolish when you and I, the very servants of them in their new world order, the ones who would not go along but were rebels against their new world order when it comes and are willing to die if called upon or flee to a place of safety and they can't get to us, they're going to feel mighty silly when we are the ones with a new glorified body and they are to learn the ways of Jesus. And we suddenly become the teachers, not them. Verse 30, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So why has he called me to be a preacher to you? Why has he called you to be a listener and a learner and a disciple of Jesus? Because in the eyes of the world, we're nothing. But in the eyes of God, you're special, you're called, you're chosen. And as far as I know, you're remaining faithful in everything. This is who God is looking to today, to be the rulers for tomorrow, when the atonement for the rest of the world will begin. Notice Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Yes, his forgiveness. You and I today have already received it when we had our sins forgiven. When we repented and came under the leadership of Jesus Christ, we went down into that watery grave of baptism. We said, we're forming an agreement, an alliance with you, Father. We're coming into a con contractual relationship, a covenant with you. You forgive me of my sins and I'll live for you. I'll prepare to be a leader in the world when you set up your kingdom. 
just give me the opportunity, I'll do it. The church today has been called ahead of time to prepare us for that final redemption. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 to 14, it says that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Yes, you heard a voice. You read a piece of literature. And then you came to a knowledge of the truth because God Almighty called you. He wooed you. And then you accepted. Then when you understood that your sins could be forgiven, you were baptized and he set a seal of the Holy Spirit inside of your mind to preserve you. Even if you died, that Holy Spirit in your mind will be the ingredient, the ingredient that is there that will resurrect you from the dead. Verse 14, which the Holy Spirit is the earnest. It's only a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That redemption is coming. It's coming. You'll have that new body. The Holy Spirit is only the down payment of the new spirit-composed body. But you'll have that new body. That's why we're here. That's the hope. That's why Jesus Christ opened our mind. He called us. We didn't go to Him. We didn't look for Him. We were looking in all the wrong places. But He came and He selected us. In Romans 8, 23... It says, and not only they, that's the people of the world, but ourselves also. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, waiting for that new body. The redemption of our body, changed from flesh and blood. Brethren, there is a scripture that is so incredible, and I've spoken of it many, many times. But after all I've said today about the redemption process, and you and I having an opportunity for salvation ahead of time to prepare us to become kings and priests and rule in the kingdom of God so that the Day of Atonement can come for the rest of the world, and you and I will be an important ingredient in that redeeming process under the authority of Jesus Christ. Here's what it said in Hebrews 11:35. Now this is the faith chapter. And it goes down and talks about many people of faith. And it says they were pressured. They went through tribulation. Some of them died. Women even raised their men, their husbands from the dead. And then it gives us why they did all that in the last sentence of verse 35. That they might obtain a better resurrection. And when you look that word better up in the Greek Strong's Concordance, it means a more noble resurrection, a more serviceable resurrection to humanity. And it means the best resurrection. God has called certain people ahead of time to be atoned for so that they can receive the best resurrection God has to offer. There is nothing better than what you're being offered today. That should so impress us that God has selected us to understand that, that we would never cross the line of sin again. We would throw anything out of our life that might be even a hint at sin. Because we're to be purified. According to Revelation 1 verse 6, Revelation 5 verse 9 and 10, Revelation 20 and verse 4, all three of those places... Plus Daniel, three different places there. It talks about us becoming kings and priests and judges and that we will possess the kingdom and will be under Jesus Christ. But all we need now, that our development spiritually, when it is finished, and that seventh trump sounds, all we'll need is a body so that we cannot be assassinated in case there is a rebel in the kingdom. And before that rebel is ferreted out, 
In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. There's one problem, though, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when, we, when he shall appear, that's Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You cannot look upon God now in the face and live. He told that to Moses on Mount Sinai. This says we will see him as he is. So that means a body composition will be changed. We will have the same body that he does. Spirit, with energy, with power, it says we will see him as he is because when he appears, we will be like him. And when we understand that, Verse 3 should send shivers down every one of our backs if we ever think of compromising God's ways. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as Jesus is pure. We should never once think that we can get away with sin, compromise with sin, do the things of the world and be like the world because if we have the hope of becoming identical to Jesus Christ at the seventh trump, same body composition, perfection so that we will never sin again, then why would we compromise with that? Would we choose the lake of fire instead to destroy us? I hardly think so. Not if we have any sanity about us. Notice what Jesus is going to look like, though, in Revelation 1, 13 to 16. And this is what you're going to look like. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. That's pure energy, power emanating out of his eyes. And his feet like a fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his, the vo his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. And his countenance, here's what he looked like was as the sun shines in its strength. You talk about power. We can't even look at the sun. It'll burn our retina out of our eyes. This is the power Jesus is giving to every one of us. He's entrusting us with it because we accepted the atonement of Jesus in advance of the rest of the world. An awesome thing. Out of all the six point some billion people on earth, God chose you one person. Why didn't he choose somebody in another nation or somebody down the street, but he chose you? That's how important you are to him. But wait. We all know that God is calling us now to receive that new body at the seventh trump. But what about all others that have lived? I've got five minutes to tell about a two-hour tale. We know that Revelation eleven eighteen says it will be the time of the dead. This is after the Feast of Trumpets. It's the Day of Atonement, but it's before the Feast of Tabernacles ever comes. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26 to 28, it tells us that we are to keep a day of atonement. Now, if people have died thousands of years ago and they never knew who Jesus Christ was, and there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved, they've never heard of the name of Jesus Christ. How are they going to be saved? How are they going to be atoned for? I'm thankful that God has, in his great 
mindset, a plan, a plan so awesome so that everyone will have an opportunity. And here's what it says in Isaiah 26, verse 19. Your dead men shall live. And Isaiah even said, together with my dead body, they shall arise. Yes, notice the last phrase of verse 19, Isaiah 26. And the earth shall cast out the dead. Is there anything too hard for God? He can resurrect every single person that has ever lived because they have a DNA pattern. He can resurrect them from the dead. It doesn't matter how long or how recently they died. But God has a plan and the earth is going to cast out the dead. I won't read all this. You can read it on your own time. But in Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16 verse 53 to 63. It tells of how Samaria, how Sodom is going to be resurrected from the dead. They will be better off than they were before. And when you get down right toward the end, verse 61 or 60, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. This is Israel. I will establish unto you an everlasting covenant. Then shall you remember your ways. He's already talked about Sodom before and Samaria. Those were Gentile areas. You'll remember your ways and you'll be ashamed. Well, how could they remember them if they've been dead for thousands of years unless the earth cast out the dead? When you shall receive your sisters, your elder and your younger, and I will give them unto you for daughters but not by the covenant, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Yes, the first time they'll know who their Savior is, that you may remember. Yes, when he brings them from the dead, they're going to remember their sins and be confounded. Yes, confounded that they're alive. And those in America, they've been told by every minister there is if they don't obey Jesus right now, if they get hit by a truck when they walk out the church door, they're going down the chute to hell and burn forever and ever. Well, they're going to be confounded because they're going to be cast out of the earth alive. And then they're going to see the salvation of the Lord and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame, the sinful lifestyle you've lived. But I'm going to give you salvation when I'm pacified toward you for all that you've done, says the Lord. And then, of course, the big scripture. Ezekiel 37 this great valley of dry bones that are very old. And he was asked, Ezekiel, do you know what these bones are? Of course, Ezekiel answered, you know, Lord, you tell me. He proceeded to do exactly that. When you read verse 1 to 14, it's telling about how all these bones are going to come together. God will bring flesh upon them. He'll put their internal parts. Yes, they will come out of their graves, verse 12, or verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are lost, because Billy Graham told them they would be if they didn't accept that night. And our hope is lost. We're cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, cause you to come up out of your graves, bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I'm the Lord when I have opened your graves, not a minute before then. Only you and I that have been selected ahead of time will believe it. The rest of them does not know who Jesus is until they come out of the grave. O oh, my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. 
Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. Then when you read from verse 15 on down through verse 28, it tells us that all of Israel, the northern ten tribes and the tribes of Judah, are going to come together. They will be one, one nationality again. And then who is going to rule over them? The Bible tells us who those, their ruler will be, the resurrected King David, verse 25, verse 24. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my, my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they, and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince. So King David trained to become a king to rule over all 12 tribes of Israel, and he will. And the people are going to clap their hands when they see him come on the stage because he will be teaching them. And they will be glad because they're not still in the grave or they're not burning in an ever-burning hell fire because the earth cast out the dead and salvation for them is going to be offered. Brethren, I want to summarize what I've said today. We have been redeemed today to be born as sons and daughters of God. We have been called ahead of time for salvation, for the best resurrection that God the Father offers. We're to become spirit, and 1 Corinthians 15 says, immortal. We will be the kings and the priests and the judges when God's kingdom reigns on planet earth. The world will come out of the graves. The day of atonement will be concluded. The whole world will for the first time hear the truth. The world will be atoned. You will be their teachers. And then the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ will begin. Brethren, if you've understood these things today, happy are you.